Most people can lose weight. I mean, everybody that has had a weight problem probably has lost some weight at some point in their life. But the real problem people have is keeping it off. And so I have some stats here to show you. Um, kind of grim stats. So only 17% of Americans have been shown to be able to sustain a 10% weight loss after one year. It seems like I can eat whatever I want to and never gain any weight. And then the other person says, I hate you. You just have a fast metabolism. <laughs> So here's the thing about me being a scientist. This is a, basically a variation of the same uh, conversation. You know, you are what you eat and I'm half what I eat. Um, we all observe this. There are people who, we, you know, we live in this obesogenic environment and there are some people who are resistant to it somehow. Like they just, they don't seem to gain any weight. And sometimes you watch these people and it seems like they eat a lot of food and, and you sit there and you scratch your head, you know, why is it that some people just blow up and then other people just seem to be resistant to weight? So these reduced obese people, they have to eat less than what you think they should eat just to maintain their weight. So something's going on. Maybe they have slow metabolisms, but metabolism is just one component of energy expenditure. But what we do know is that their energy expenditure is lower than what you would predict it should be for their weight and height and everything. Energy that we expend each day. So there are three main components to energy expenditure. So this is, would be the three main components in a physically active person. So first, the majority of our energy expenditure, even a physically active person, comes from our resting metabolic rate. So now the Rudolf Weigel's lab, looking at activity energy expenditure in these people, in these reduced obese people. Activity energy expenditure was lowered by nearly 400 calories per day. 400 calories per day, that's a, that's a large amount. The better, we, the, the better tasting the food, the more we eat, right? I mean, it's, it's really simple, really, in a sense. But some people are more sensitive to food reward than others, and that food reward tends to override our natural appetite regulation. When we talk about loss of fat mass, the energy expenditure during exercise is actually one of the strongest predictors of how much fat you're gonna lose. I'm gonna talk about this today. We, um, you know, a lot of people get into this idea of post-exercise energy expenditure and the afterburn, and that's why interval training is so popular because a lot of people think, oh, I'm gonna burn all these calories after I'm done exercising. I'm, I'm gonna show you the research on that. It's not quite as big as you might think. 85% when I'm, if I'm doing the approximately same amount of work, mechanical work or load volume, my energy expenditure is gonna be similar. Now, resistance training volume, how does that affect energy expenditure? Mike Menser there pop, really made the whole one set to failure, HIT type training very popular. Um, well, here's the deal though, when you do that type of training, the training volume is so low, your energy expenditure is actually very low. So resistance training did cause a higher epoch, but the magnitude was small. I mean, you're, you're talking about, you know, what, 25 calories or so there. Not a huge amount. Now, maybe over 24 hours, that may add up more, and, and when we start talking about the impact of resistance training on resting metabolic rate, we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, but it's not huge, at least not in this particular study. So it's more time efficient. We can do more in a smaller, short, shorter period of time. But again, again, most of the benefit comes from the exercise session itself. You can see the big increase in energy expenditure here, and then some epoch there, and then you can see pretty much back to normal after a couple hours. So again, no big, no big epoch there. It was a low intensity exercise session at 50% max heart rate. So anything above the dash line is overcompensation for the exercise. Meaning they expended a certain amount of energy in the, in the exercise, but then they actually ate more than what they expected. If fast and cardio it truly works to help fat loss, it either has to increase 24 hour energy expenditure, it either, or it has to have a repartitioning effect, meaning you burn more fat and lose less than that for a given weight loss, which implies there's a protein sparing effect for fasted cardio, or there has to be some type of appetite suppressing effect, okay? It's, it's, if, if it actually helps with fat loss, it's gotta do at least one of those things. And you know what? This stuff has been tested. So, what about energy expenditure? No impact of fasted cardio on 24 hour energy expenditure, okay? So we can cross that off. How about repartitioning effect? 
Well, fasted cardio, what it does, yeah, it increases the amount of fat you burn over 24 hours, but it does so by sparing carbs, not protein. And that's what this research here showed. It spared the carbohydrate. You can see carbohydrate oxidation was higher with the non-fasted cardio. It spares carbs, not protein, but what the problem with that is over time, that, that's actually going to change over time. Research shows that your body is actually going to adjust carb oxidation upwards over time and fat oxidation downwards, so, so over time it's not really going to matter. Um, and also, and Brad actually wrote an article on this just recently, fat oxidation doesn't tell you where the fat's coming from. Okay. Um, a lot of the fat you burn during exercise comes from intramuscular triglycerides. So these are fat droplets stored in your muscle tissue. So, yeah, fat oxidation may go up, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's coming from your body fat. And actually, if you train on a regular basis, you actually get better at using um, intramuscular triglycerides to help spare carbohydrate for fuel. And if you look at urinary nitrogen excretion, there is no protein sparing effect. And in fact, some research has shown if you exercise in a condition of low muscle glycogen, which would be true in a fasted state, you actually increase protein degradation. And in fact, again, muscle glycogen is the lowest after an overnight fast. So, is there going to be a repartition effect? No. So now it leaves us with that, okay, well maybe it helps suppress appetite. Well, this has been looked at as well. In fact, cardio after breakfast suppressed appetite more than fasted cardio. And ad libitum energy intake was actually not significantly lower after fed cardio. So in terms of appetite, it's actually better to do fed cardio and not fasted cardio. So there's your ad libitum energy intake there. So we can cross that off. So From James, first time I've seen James present. Fantastic presentation, really, really engaging. Uh, probably helped that it was all fresh information to myself. Fresh in terms of not... Uh, seeing it presented before. It was things I'd heard about, not necessarily completely brand new. So the biggest takeaways I took from James was um, talking about metabolic adaption and the myth of kind of uh, the fact that we can damage our metabolism and that that doesn't really happen. And then because metabolic adaption does happen where our metabolic rate does downregulate as we diet, the components of that and that RMR your resting metabolic rate is really not impacted to a huge degree. I've talked about this before in an article um, talking about how you can't really be gaining weight on less than a thousand calories a day. There's something else going on because your resting metabolic rate in studies, kind of the biggest they've ever seen it come down is about 10%, which isn't going to be a huge amount of calories. It's not going to be the difference between you kind of where you should be in a calorie deficit and then gaining weight. It's just not the case. So that was very interesting and I think an important thing for many people to take on board. Um, and then the major component of metabolic adaption is actually in your physical activity. And less so your formal exercise and more to do with your non-exercise uh, activity thermogenesis. Or some people split this into NEAT and NEPA, which is non-exercise physical activity. Either way, just call it NEAT. And that's basically things like going for a walk, standing up, sitting, moving around like this. And that contributes, contributes a huge, huge deal. Um, and that it's highly, highly individual. So you might have two people doing different jobs. You might just have someone who's kind of a slouch. They don't use all their muscles. They kind of sit like this versus someone who sits upright and moves and uh, does this sort of thing. And there's such huge inter-individuality that it can be up to 2,000 calories. And even in kind of closed, isolated rooms where they had virtually nowhere to move, there was huge, huge variation. So that was my biggest take, take home point from James in that NEAT is huge and you should do everything that you can to try and bring your NEAT up if your goal is fat loss. Um, because as we get leaner, as we diet down, Though there is differences, everyone reduces their need, they get more efficient. Um, and the king is 24-hour activity. We don't burn that many calories in an hour in the gym. And then after that hour in the gym, the kind of uh, six-pack shortcut, uh, kind of talking about the epoch, the afterburn effect, is very small. So you have to look at the 
bigger picture and that's that total energy usage in the 24 hours. So that's what I took away, my main points taken away from Jen.